Hey everybody, welcome back to the IoT Village virtual event. We're gonna kick off our career panel now. Uh, we've got a great group of people who wanna talk to you uh, about what it's like to have a career in this industry. Talk about the different certifications you get at different stages. And be sure to submit questions through Discord or right here on Twitch. And they will not only be answering your questions live, but we're also going to have a networking lounge uh, right in Discord. It's called the INE Career Advice Voice Channel. That's going to be live right after the panel. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Don to kick things off. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you awesome. loud and clear. Cool deal. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. We're really excited to be able to uh, share some of our experience with all of you um, from very different uh, perspectives. Um, now, what I'm absolutely not going to do today, I, without a doubt, I am not going to try and uh, uh, tell a story that might be anything close to what Ted said in his purse snatching story uh, in the keynote. But I thought that was fantastic. It was a great analogy uh, about what community can really do, what we can do together. Um, and that's something that I do at INE. So as most of you may know me, uh, I am Don. I'm better known on ethical uh, as Ethical Hacker on the Twitterverse. Um, but I am also the Director of Community for INE as well as eLearn Security. Um, and so with that, I, I want to give you guys a little bit of the lay of the land of what we're going to try to accomplish today, and then I'm going to bring in my guests and have them introduce themselves, and then we're just going to have a discussion. And if you'd like to, as Rachel mentioned, have some of your questions uh, answered, please feel free to either use Discord or use Twitch. Either one is good with us. So I think the first thing that I want to bring up is that age-old question that probably everybody on this panel has gotten just numerous times enough to where it, it, it almost becomes uh, <laughs> the, the oh my God question that we get every time we do a talk like this. And that is, what's more important, education, experience, or certifications? Now, my normal answer to that is normally yes, all of them. So, <laughs> but what that normally uh, tries to indicate or I can usually tell who's asking that based on that question is that it's somebody who's usually new to the industry because if they're asking that, it's almost like, well, what should I do? What should I focus on? Should it be that education or going to a university or doing self-education? Should it be going out and getting a job and skipping that university experience? Um, and that experience will help build my CV or my resume, or should I go out and focus all my energy on certs? So with that, again, now you see why my answer is usually yes, because anything you can do to bolster that resume is really what you should do. But the other thing is, is that, and pretty much what we want to try and cover today, we don't necessarily feel that those things are only for those people who are entering the industry for the first time. So we want to talk today about cybersecurity careers that have to do with certifications and advancing your career, your resume building, that kind of stuff, and where it is in different areas of your career. And we want to do that from three different vantage points. So obviously, I'm with INE and and eLearn Security, so I'm going to be talking about the viewpoint from the training organization or certification body. Also with me today, we have John Hammond, who is a senior security researcher and uh, influencer slash YouTuber. And he's going to give you the viewpoint of the actual cybersecurity professional. And then, of course, we have Sarah Pickering with us today. She's the director of talent development right here for ISE. And she will be giving you the viewpoint from HR or the hiring manager's perspective. So with that, you've heard enough from me. Let me hand it over to Sarah first, and she will be introducing herself in her own words. Thanks, Sarah, for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, thank you for having me. I always, always appreciate doing a panel with you. Um, so I am the, the Director of Talent Development at ISC. Um, we built the IoT Village. Um, I have been here for two years, um, but I've been in um, IT and IT human resources for, for almost 15. Um, but I do all of the, the human resources and the people strategy at ISC, uh, which includes recruiting, it includes training, and also career development. 
Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. I know this is not the first time uh, that we've done this, and it won't be the last. We already have several scheduled throughout the year. Last year was a ton of fun, um, and it was a, a great pleasure getting to know you and making that transition to these types of virtual events. Um, and everyone out there, just so you know, Sarah is definitely an expert in hacking HR, so you're going to enjoy what she has to share here today. Uh, next, we have John Hammond. Hey, John, welcome. Thanks hey. again. Uh, kind of like with Sarah, this is not the first time we've done things together and it won't be the last. So maybe you can uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself because I already know that. <laughs> hey there. Thanks so much. I, uh, this is awesome. Thank you for letting me be part of the party. Uh, my name is John Hammond. Kind of as mentioned, uh, I am a security researcher over at Huntress, uh, which is a managed threat detection company uh, in the cybersecurity space. So I kind of work as half analyst, half operator, uh, and still have that influencer, I hate that word, <laughs> content creator <laughs> flair. Uh, I try to produce content and educate others in, in videos and cybersecurity concepts and training and capture the flag. So uh, I'm super excited. I think this is going to be an awesome conversation. Me too. Um, I'm excited to have you both here. Um, and if you guys haven't checked it out, without a doubt, go check out uh, John's YouTube channel. He has a knack for not only blowing your mind with what he does, but also explaining it to you in a way that you're like, oh, I didn't know I could do it that way. Or, oh, that's cool. I think I can actually do that. Or even better, I think I understand that now. So go check it out. It's definitely worth your time. So, and this has a lovely voice. Listen to that voice. <laughs> well, hey, thank you. Absolutely. So, the the kind of the lay of the land today, and the schedule that we want to try and go over is go over those three different areas of somebody's career. So, I want to start off by talking about you know entry level uh, participants trying to get into either IT or cybersecurity. So those people who will have either little to no experience, um, they're either just coming out of college, but now that we're finding that cybersecurity as an industry is growing, we're actually finding that there's a lot more buckets where these people are coming from. So they're not only coming from universities, but we're also finding that again, because cybersecurity is just, well, let's just face it, it's pretty damn cool. Um, but, people who are coming from other areas of IT and joining cybersecurity. But then there's that third bucket of those people who are coming into the InfoSec industry who have never been in any kind of technical field at all. They're career changers and they could be any walk of life at any age, at any experience level. And those are people we want to address in that category as well. So next up, we'll have a group of conversations and questions around that mid-level person. So somebody who may already be in InfoSec, but they're either at a junior level, they may be working in, uh, in InfoSec, but they don't necessarily have a lot of experience. They may have a few of those entry level, you know, check the box kind of certifications. And what is that like? How do you get there? How does that affect my career? And then finally, that senior level moving into that expert level is there really still even a need for cybersecurity certifications? And what can that do for you if that's something that you want to pursue? All right, so with that, how about we share a story, each of us, um, on that entry level position? So, uh, John, I think I wanna start with you because recently um, I know I heard a story from you about how you started your career and how you eventually got into it, but there was a time where you saw that that spark was there. You knew this is what you wanted to do, but you had no experience. You were just in school, no certifications, and yet here you are today. So maybe you can share some of those uh, beginning steps that you took in your career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if I'll kind of hit the nail on the head for what you're getting at. So he, please feel free to uh, pick and prod me to make sure I go in that direction there. Uh, but I can tell you a little bit of my story. It's kind of weird. Uh, I'll be brief. I'll try and be quick. Uh, so I had uh, wanted to get smart on this, right? And uh, I wanted to learn cybersecurity, but as kind of a, a budding individual, everyone told me like, hey, well, you, you have to go to school. It's just kind of what was done. It's just kind of what is done. You have to go for your undergraduate and college degree. Uh, I didn't want to have to pay for that. <laughs> so I, I went to uh, one of the United States military academies. I, I went to the US Coast Guard Academy uh, and I studied electrical engineering there because that was the closest they had for tech. They didn't have computer science nor cybersecurity. So I kind of got stuck with some systems and signals that I 
don't use whatsoever in my day-to-day -day job. So a lot of what I have learned in cybersecurity has kind of been kind of my own venture off on the side. Uh, but fun fact, some folks that might not know, I didn't graduate and I don't have a degree. Uh, so if I'm out in the real world, if I'm in the industry looking for a job, uh, and this was kind of the state that I was in getting kicked out just a, just a week before graduation without the receipt in my hand, uh, I was reaching out and sending applications everywhere that I could, but I'm this green fella without any certifications, without a degree, uh, all the all the training that I have had is really just in my head and I don't have a whole lot to show for it. Uh, so some companies, some individuals that I was reaching out to, I, I got to the job interview and I tried to show up in a suit and look all fancy, sell myself. Uh, but I, I realized, hey, the white elephant in the room is I don't have anything under my belt to, to showcase. Uh, somehow, I uh, they bought into it and they, they gave me a chance. They, they trusted me. Uh, but I knew that, man, I have a long road ahead of me and I'm going to need to get smart on this, especially in the realm of certifications. Coming from kind of the military government and getting into that field as I entered the industry, I needed to meet even like compliance and like regulations. Oh, you need to be DOD IAT level two or something. Uh, so within six months, within three months of just being even in my first job, they say, hey, John, go, go get something, go do some training, go to a certification. Uh, and my first certification was Security Plus. But that was enough to kind of get my foot in the door. And it, it keeps moving on from there. So no, that's, I think that's enough to get the conversation started. <laughs> Ab absolutely. And uh, just something that we were talking about kind of in the pregame. Um, even though I work for INE, which owns eLearn Security, which is a certification body, um, I just want the audience to know that this discussion is going to be vendor agnostic. It's also going to be certification agnostic. So feel free to mention anything, any, uh, any certification body, any organization that does training as well. We're here to help you not necessarily pitch one thing or another. So uh, not only can you guys feel free to talk about that, but anybody who has a question, feel free to ask a question on anything. So that actually kind of steals a little bit of my thunder because I actually Sorry. have some very similar things in my past. And so what I will share with everyone is that when I was younger, um, school was never a thing for me. I just didn't like it. And I think there's a lot of people who are in IT that feel exactly the same way. So when I started getting into IT, uh, of course, that was quite a while ago, but I was messing with things like an Osborne One that had a CPM operating system. It had no hard drive. And the only thing out there were bulletin board systems. That was even before we had, you know, the uh, early adopters into this, you know, thing like America Online. But my particular favorite one at that time was the source. But that being said, if you put me in front of a computer, that will, that felt like home. That was something that I wanted to dive into and figure everything out about it. So eventually, maybe we could do this uh, in the networking lounge later so it's not officially live, but I can share my story with you. And maybe, John, I'll invite you to do that as well uh, as Sarah, to share your very first hacker uh, or hacking experience. What was the very first thing that you hacked? We'll do that later in the lounge. Again, a little... Uh, incentive for people to join us in that after this talk. But with that, I just wasn't that interested in school. Now I did well on things like standardized tests. So I actually got a full ride to a, a university. I didn't like it. I couldn't stand it. Um, it. It was just something that just didn't click with me. So I eventually left and very much like John, I never went back and finished. So I also do not have a degree. Now, with that, I was slowly able to, you know, convince people that I knew what I was doing just based on the way I talked and what I could do, what I could show them. So I eventually got a job and I worked my way up. But there was a point in my career where I felt like I was hitting that ceiling. I knew all of this stuff, but I couldn't prove it because I didn't have those letters after my name. So like, like any good techie, I started doing some research and I probably went a little overboard because I started compiling all this information. And what I realized is that even though IT was a thing of mine, but security was something that really grabbed me as well. But there was no single source of information back then 
that had everything that you wanted to know about security certifications. So I have entrepreneurial blood in my veins. You can blame my parents for that. Thank you very much. But I bought the domain name certifiedsecuritypro.com and I created an online magazine to put all this information out there and talk to people about what are their experiences with this because that didn't exist. Well, lo and behold, at the same time, I happened to buy the domain name ethicalhacker.net, which probably a lot more people know than the first venture that I did. Um, but along those lines, I not only learned a lot, but then also, like John, I didn't want to have to pay for all of that training, but I wanted to get those certifications. Not only did I not want to pay for them, honestly, if I wanted to, I couldn't afford them. So by creating this, uh, and having that entrepreneurial mindset. Today, it's more like what John does where you are a content creator. That was kind of the content creator back in the day where you kind of had to create your own thing. You know, there was no medium, there weren't these big YouTube influencers and what have you. So I created this as a way to say, hey, I'm part of the media. I'm gonna do a review of your course and your certification. All you have to do is let me in for free and I'll give you all this, you know, publicity. So sure enough, that worked. And that's kind of how I hacked my way into getting all of this free training and getting those uh, <laughs> those letters after my name. So now I have things like my MCSE. Uh, I have uh, my Security Plus. And in fact, there was a time where I was a Security Plus SME where I helped write the exam questions. Um, but I have my CISSP and there's a bunch of others. Um, but that's kind of how I hacked it and got my way into advancing my career, even though I didn't have those certifications. And without a doubt, they helped. I still could go into a job interview and I had that knowledge and I had that experience, but now I had that extra thing. Because in the beginning, when we talked about having those three important areas, education, experience, and certifications, well, I only had one out of two or one out of three. Now I have two. Was it in the cards for me to go get that third one? Probably not. So I had to pick up those other two pillars as much as I could. So that being said, let me hand it over to Sarah now and say, hey, how did you start your career? How did you hack your way into doing what you wanted to do? But then also, when you start interviewing people, you're going to get those, because uh, basically what you guys do at IEC is a lot more senior level, but you're going to get a lot of people that will apply for that job kind of like what John was in the beginning, where he didn't have that experience, he didn't have those certifications. How do you handle those candidates? And do you eventually hire them? Do you not? How do you treat them? I give you the floor. Thanks, Don. Uh, so I'm kind of like the opposite of where, like I probably am far more educated than I need to be, <laughs> which I would kind of advise against. Um, so I did my, my undergrad in Japanese and I went to a very expensive, um, uh, liberal arts school and I uh, came out just in just loads and loads and loads of debt. Um, just I'll be paying it off until the day I die. So um, I would definitely recommend to people that if you do really feel the need to check that box and have that degree, um, but you're not sure what you want to do, go to community college. Um, don't spend a whole lot of money um, if you can stay close to home and live at home, save money that way, do do the community college, get your degree that way. Um, now, I do have my master's degree in human resources, which is really helpful. But honestly, my HR certifications, I have two. I have the, the SHRM CP and the PHR. Those have been so vital to me uh, when it comes to employment law. Um, those certifications are certifications that um, you have to renew every three years. You have to get professional development units um, throughout those for three years. You have to get a whole bunch of them and you have to stay up to date and keep moving. Those types of certifications are really important in my field because, you know, the law is always changing. Best practices are sort of being updated and changing. And so certifications like that um, can really show an employer that, look, I stay on top of things. Um, a certification that you received, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, what have you, um, might not be as meaningful if you're, you know, if it's not one that you have to stay up to date on. So that's, that's my background. I would highly recommend not taking that route, um, <laughs> especially when employers, um, you know, the IRS regulations on employers paying for, for tuition and, and training is, $5,000 a year and most employers 
have that. They have a, a reimbursement uh, program. So if it is something that you do eventually want to get, you want to get that bachelor's to check that box, you want to get those certifications, try to get them through your employer because that is really the way to go. Um, but, you know, we we do have a lot of senior people at ISE. Uh, we don't require degrees or certifications. We realized a long time ago that that isn't everything. And, you know, especially with degrees, some people just don't test well. And that's not what it's about. And you guys both know, like going to school, just it's not your thing. Um, but there's so many ways to learn. And I mean, just, I mean, most of this industry, cybersecurity, it's like you most folks have been hacking since they were like 13 years old, right? From your first computer, you started hacking things or taking things apart. I mean, my older brother was taking apart any electronic in the house. He could, couldn't put them back together. But, you know, from that young age, people are learning. And so having those degrees and certifications early on aren't nearly as meaningful than the, that hands-on stuff you've been doing um, since you were a kid. So, we we do have a really robust internship program at ISC. Um, and so if people don't have certifications, the thing that we're looking for is like, how, what else are you doing? Um, we really look for like, let's let's see what your home lab looks like. We want to see that you got in there and you built out a bunch of stuff. Um, we want to see that you play CTFs. Um, like ours and everywhere, um, you know, folks that say I played in and, this and John's that. and John talks about that all the time. Yeah. He's an expert on it. Yeah. I sing the praises of CTF. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, we just saw him do, we've been seeing John's CTFs and our CTF, like all of them, they're just everywhere. And like, that's the kind of stuff we want to see people do, um, really get their hands dirty and, and get in there. And I know, uh, you know, I and E's a lot of those um, training courses and stuff. Those are labs. It's just a real hacking, getting getting your hands in there and in, in the weeds. Um, so maybe some bug bounties if you're, you know, if you're publishing CDs. Those are the type of things that we really want to see. Um, but you know what? There's those those sort of entry level certs are something that, you know, when it comes down to it, if we have candidates without them versus candidates with. Yeah, you're pro you're gonna beat out those other candidates. We're gonna you're gonna get the, you know, the shortlist pile. We're at least gonna make that. You're not going straight to the trash. It kind of shows um, that you've got this passion, that you've got this drive, right? It it takes it's not a short amount of time to study and prepare for a certification exam, right? You you really have to buckle down and get through it, and that that definitely is a sign um, to us that you have some dedication and drive and that you have the patience to sit down and, and do something like that. So um, yeah, even at our level, we still look for that. You know, it's not a must have, we're not gonna write someone off um, if they don't have a certification, but it, it can show us um, how much somebody cares. Awesome. Now, I do see some questions that are coming in, and you actually addressed one already, but I just want to let this person know. Um, they, they were asking, do you need to complete graduate school in order to get into a cybersecurity field, like becoming an ethical mm -hmm. hacker, a person that enjoys coding, Discord bots, competing in CTS, that kind of stuff? I, I think you addressed that uh, pretty clearly, that that's not really a requirement anymore. And not just with companies like ISE, but you're seeing massive companies like Google and Microsoft basically say the same thing, that they are no longer requiring <clears throat> degrees. While I take a sip, uh, John, I'm gonna throw it towards you. You said that you started with uh, Security Plus. What are some other entry level certifications that you think might meet this uh, you know, no experience entry level category that could help somebody's career out to get their foot yeah. in the door? Oh, this is a really good question. Um, so Security Plus, in my mind, is is kind of in one bucket of, of certifications. Um, and there are a plethora of, of others, right, kind of in that same umbrella. Uh, but when I had taken Security Plus, it was a multiple choice test that you needed to absorb a lot of high level information uh, so that you could talk the talk. You, you knew the conversation of cybersecurity, you knew the lingo, the terminology, and you could kind of piece together what, what did what and wh how everything looked across the landscape. But it was, it was conversational is kind of the best way that I, I, I can put it. Um, the other bucket, in, in my opinion, and this is the one that I love and adore and have so much enjoyment out of, uh, is more practical, hands-on 
application-based certifications where the, the culminating test or the exam isn't strictly a you know, data dump, rote memorization, regurgitating answers on a multiple choice thing, uh, but you're really on the keyboard going through some practical exercises to uh, accomplish some task and you're an operator, you're, you're doing it for real. I like that so, so much more because I think it proves a lot of merit and, and competency. Um, there are a ton of ones that fit the bucket for those practical hands-on exercises and certifications. The one that I think is the most fundamental and, and foundational and great for those beginners that do want to get into the scene uh, is, I'll have to say it, I think the uh, eLearn Security Junior Penetration Tester, EJPT, certainly takes the cake. Well, thanks for mentioning that. And again, we don't pay him to do that. No, um, no, no. <laughs> and in fact, that is something that he's mentioned. Um, I, again, I don't want this to turn into a commercial for everything that we do, but I, I'm a big fan of it as well, even you know before I joined the company, because uh, I've been with eLearn Security a little over three years now, about three and a half years. Um, and you know that was even before the acquisition by INE. And I, I think some of the impressive things that we've done on the INE side is that not only do you have access to everything on a single platform, not just cybersecurity, but all these other areas, but also go check it out. If you check out um, the pinned topics in Discord, you will find that we offer what's called the Starter Pass. And with the Starter Pass, you get the penetration testing student course absolutely free. That includes unlimited lab time for that hands-on stuff John was talking about. The only thing it does not include is the actual EJPT certification exam voucher, but it's a ton of free stuff for you to do. Go check that out. That's enough I'll say about that. But I'm, I'm also with you. I like those two different buckets. I like the ones that check off things like uh, the DOD 8570. There's a bunch of those that fit that where they're a multiple choice exam. Um, you know, and even, you know, higher level certs, as they say, like CISSP, um, you know, those types of certifications, you know, or, or CISM, there's a, there's a number of them out there that are geared more towards, you know, philosophical ideas or becoming eventually a manager. And they're not necessarily a hands-on technical certification, but that's information you need to know when you're working in any organization because you need to know the hierarchy, you need to know the way in which things are done, reported up the chain, and so on and so forth. Now, that being said, not everything that you want to do is on that 8570 DOD list, which actually is now, uh, they, they modified it a little bit, it's now actually a subset of 8140. But let me throw that towards you, Sarah, because in HR, I know that you mentioned earlier that by having the certifications, you may bubble up to the top of the pile are there any uh, situations where by not having the certification that is specifically in a job description, that they will be automatically eliminated through all of the automated tools that are now in HR application software? At ISC, definitely not. Um, I think, you know, certainly John could talk more about, you know, the, the government sector. Um, you might see a little bit more of that, right? Or act, n not even just not government direct, but even the government contractors, like those the big the big guys, right? That are, are providing services. Um, some they need those certifications sometimes, right? Like the more certifications that you have when you're when they're submitting to an RFP, any, anybody that's doing an RFP, right? <laughs> it's like oof. Um, the more boxes they can check, the higher the rate they can charge. Um, so some of those places, that's, that's what they're looking for. They're not, they're sometimes looking for those check boxes more than they're looking for the quality. They're looking for the skill. Um, so at ISC, definitely not. Um, but you know, it, and it, it depends. I do think I'm going to kind of piggyback off what John was saying, those hands-on certifications when you're entry level can be really helpful in that it's pretty rare for you to have a, you know, uh, an interview process that doesn't include some sort of hands-on test or, you know, ISC has a web app challenge. Um, there's gonna be a technical piece uh, to getting in the door and those hands-on certifications that you're doing are a really great way to train for those types of things. So maybe the certification itself isn't what's going to get you in the door, 
but this, the stuff that you're learning is going to help you get, get through that process. And I think that's a great transition point to make as we move into those two different buckets that John was talking about, because some of those ones that are multiple choice, they're on the DOD list, they're required for certain things, without a doubt, go get those because it, it will not only let you bubble up to the top, but again, those automated features when people are you know doing searches through thousands of resumes, you're not even going to appear on any list whatsoever if you don't check that box. John, did you want to? Uh, yeah, throw can I add in a there? little sticky note on that of one? Of course. Uh, I will say, and I will add my testament here. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, when I applied to some jobs, when I was looking around, there was uh, one government entity. And, I, so, and again, not to say strictly in that sector, um, but it is more common there. So just to say these do exist. Uh, there was an individual that I was interview, uh, was having a conversation with. Hey, I'm interested in this role. Uh, they said, like, hey, do you have. CEH or CISP? I said, no, honestly, I don't. Uh, and I thought that was kind of weird because those seemed like very vastly <laughs> different things. <laughs> uh, but they're check boxes. <laughs> but I wanted to apply and I couldn't because I didn't have that. So th the reason that I got CEH was so I could have this conversation with this company. Uh, and that's literally it. <laughs> so I, I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll put my finger on that. The, those do really exist. And they have their purpose. They're, they're totally necessary in some regards. Uh, there is a, a space for them. And uh, that's why I have a, a few. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, you know, I, I, again, I've been in this industry for a long time. So even though I work for a certification and training organization now, there are a lot of other ones. And I personally don't believe not only from a business standpoint, but also just my own standpoint, that there are not, there, there, there are some that have a lot less value than others. But I don't like to badmouth any organization or any certification because as you said, it depends on where they are in, in the hierarchy. There are things that you need, again, which is why we kind of structured it this way, that you need for that entry level job. And maybe that's that tr nice transition again, going from our entry level discussion into our mid-level discussion. Um, and as you want to get that job to eventually get to that mid-level position, as Sarah said, you are absolutely going to need to show that you are proficient with hands-on. You're not gonna be able to BS your way you know, through that technical portion of a job interview. And the only way to really get that if you don't have experience at, through a job is actually getting hands-on practice. Now, there are a lot of training organizations like INE as well as others that offer that. But John, here's something else that we could probably throw at then. I'm sure Sarah, you have a few suggestions as well, but to get to also that mid-level range, there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of overcome what we've often talked about, John, uh, overcoming that catch-22. Well, I don't have the experience, so I can't get the job. But if I can't get the job, how do I get the experience? And it's this, how, how do I break that cycle? Well, I'll throw out a few. If any of you have seen my webinars, you know that I have this huge list of things. But some things like John will mention are CTFs. Also, volunteering your time. Now, whether that is with an open source project or a nonprofit organization, that barrier to accepting you as providing these services is a lot lower. So without a doubt, you can now start putting or getting some experience that you can actually put on your resume. Sarah mentioned earlier, doing some bug bounties. You don't have to be in the top 10 uh, of a bug bounty program in order to prove your worth, but if you show the initiative that, hey, I not only signed up and I did a few, you may not even have gotten a bug, but at least you, uh, or I should say you collected a bounty, but you, you can just show that that's an experience that you've had. And these are now things that you can talk about in a real world uh, uh, scenario when you're doing that technical portion of a job interview. So with that, John, I'll move this towards you. So moving into that mid-level, all right, so let's say you, you, you got your security plus, uh, you, you ticked those boxes, you, you got that entry level job, but that's not enough quite yet. There's a lot more you wanna learn. There's a lot more you wanna do, but you can't really do that unless you actually have the additional job. How did you overcome that? Were there other certifications that you looked at, additional training? What was it that got you to that mid-level? Yeah, there are a lot of different things to un unpack there. So I'll try and get it straight in my head. Um, the Catch-22, the that predicament hey chicken and the egg problem of i need the job to get the experience i need experience to get a job uh 
<laughs> I, I say this a lot and I've probably beaten the dead horse on this because the, uh, there's a lot you can say, and, and Don had said already, between participating in Capture the Flag or attending security conferences, networking and volunteering there, trying to offer a talk or be present in the community. Uh, and this can happen anytime. Be a even, content creator. Yeah. So I don't mean to just slam that and, and throw it at people, be a content creator, because I realize it's not always for some folks. But even if it's just documenting what you're learning, even if it's just showing your work is kind of the phrase that I've come to, to know and loves. Dude, put it out on your blog, uh, write an article. I don't care. Make your GitHub accessible and, and public and share it around on, on Twitter or upload videos on YouTube, whatever. Uh, if it shows that you're active and in it and you can literally give that to someone, then I think that goes pretty far in an interview or, or chatting with HR. I see Sarah nodding her head over there. Uh, that's, one thing, and that's what I would steamroll and repeatedly say over and over again to fight the catch-22. Uh, when, when it comes to moving forward as the next conversation of, okay, how do we move out of the introductory level and get into the now more growth? Uh, I knew in the moments uh, the catch-22 was the solution, and that was how I got hired at that job that I was telling the story about. I'm completely new. I'm completely green. That's why they took a chance on me, but I knew I... I want to be a tech. I want to be a geek. I want to be nerding out on the keyboard. Uh, so I would go after um, OSCP, right? One of the one of the well known kind of industry certifications. But it's hands on. It's practical, practical, and application based. Uh, I knew that would be the thing that would kind of set me apart from more. So I could not be doing a strict role that I was in to begin with, but maybe get really into the operator, really into the penetration testing or red team or blue team lineup. Uh, those look like the keys of the kingdom. So that's what I would start to, to run for and go after. Excellent. And Sarah, how important is it when you see a candidate and they may not be the best writer in the world, but at least they're writing, they're producing. As John said, they may not be, you know, a, a, a content creator on the video side, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a content creator. There's many ways that you can create content, either in a more technical way, a whimsical way, sharing your experiences, doing write-ups on those CTFs, John, or anything else. How important is that when you see that on a resume? Don knows every time I'm in a career channel and someone asks, like, what else should I do? I'm always writing, writing, learn how to write. It's communication is so, so important. And so like, like John said, doing those blogs and doing that research, you don't have to write up a CVE to be able to publish something, right? And it doesn't have to be video. Um, so I'm always talking about this. Um, you know, being able to communicate is definitely a way to get from that, that entry level position up into that mid level because you really need to be able to explain to especially non-technical people um, to like, COOs and to other, you know, different departments and things. Why, like this vulnerability, like what is the impact of it? What is the bigger picture in, in society and to a business? And that's really important. And so being able to communicate and influence people um, is really important, especially in cybersecurity, because there are so many organizations that don't understand why it's so important. Um, because if you've never been hacked, but why do I need this? This never happened to me. And so being able to communicate is, is, is really important. And I know there are a lot of um, certifications that require, and Don, I was, I was going to ask you if I any has any of these. I think you do where you're going through the labs, you're, you're doing the certification. And as part of that, you have to write up, show your work. You have to show your work and that gets submitted. Um, and I was kind of curious to know, who who those get read and then they get sort of graded like what are they what are they looking for are they looking for grammar um are they what are they looking for when you do those because like i said yeah communication is really important especially when it's written because you know we especially at isc you've got to write reports and you've got to turn them into a client and that client might not be technical so that written piece is huge Exactly. So a couple things on that so uh first of all absolutely when you do the EJPT exam um, although it is a multiple choice exam, it still is a practical exam because you have to log in through a VPN into a virtual environment. You have to do all the exact steps that you would normally do in a pen test. Um, 
And then that's where you get the answers. And the reason that we do that, even though, you know, we, we may not think that multiple choice exams are as higher level, but the reason that we do that is because it starts getting you thinking in that mode of, hey, I have to find something and then I have to answer a particular question and convey that to the client. When you move up from the pen testing student course, which prepares you for EJPT, up to pen testing professional, and even our advanced pen testing courses to prepare for those exams like the ECPPT, those, they treat it exactly like it's a pen test. You get a letter of engagement. It says, here's your fictitious client. Here's what, uh, what they're asking you to do. Here's your scope. But then in the end, after you perform that, you need to produce a report. And yes, in order to earn that certification, you have to write a report and that report is judged by a human. And really what they're looking to do is just to make sure that A, you found everything that we're expecting you to find and that you can at least communicate it well. Now, on that level, because we don't, uh, we don't wanna really get to a point where we're grading on grammar, that's somebody else's, but we at least want you to be able to now move from finding something and answering questions in a multiple choice environment to now doing it all on your own and writing up your own report. There's no guidance there. Of course, there are templates for reports that you can use, but th that's what we do. Um, but that's a very important point where, where you mentioned, in order to advance your career, the technical skills are fantastic, but without a doubt, you cannot advance. And John knows this as well, unless you know how to communicate what you found. And the whole point of doing a pen test is not just to use the tools and techniques that the bad guys use in order to test your own uh, organization or somebody else's with permission. It's not just to find all those vulnerabilities and ways to exploit them. It's to then turn that around into uh, something that's actionable so that way the company knows how to defend them. So eventually, kind of where that purple teaming comes in, your red team uh, type of attack now informs the blue team on how to better defend. So with that, I know that we don't have a ton of time, but we do definitely want to get to more of that senior level stuff. So once we start getting into senior level stuff, now I know that's um, in fact, I was listening to, I'll, I'll give them a shout out. I was listening to an Ask Me Anything with Bishop Fox yesterday. And they were talking about their intern programs and how they do their, their work. And even though you may be a mid-level person, you, you know, so they're entry-level people and their interns, absolutely, they cannot be left alone on an engagement. Their mid-level people still are not allowed to do an engagement on their own. And so in order to, uh, be a senior person and get to that senior expert level, you not only have to have the technical experience, but you also have to have the ability to lead teams, communicate uh, with people, whether it's on your own team or with the client, uh, or if you're doing it internally, those are things that become very important when you move to that third level. John, you wanna add anything in here? Maybe some certifications that you like that actually get you to that technical height of excellence as opposed to you know just the communication but also how important that might be I can try I'll, I'll give it my best shot um, so at the senior role right at the senior point here uh, I, I there's the question of hey do I need to continue going through certifications or is it just kind of for my learning is it just kind of for my own training is it just kind of I don't need to bypass HR or whatever words you'd like to use to get my foot in the door for a job, but it's just to have that technical acumen. Um, yes. <laughs> End of the answer is uh, that's what keeps Very you simple. sharp. That's, that's what keeps you in it. That's what keeps you with it. Um, and as you are doing your day job, right, as you have your, your gig and your role right now, you're going to be exposed to technology that you use as part of your job as what you do day to day. But when you're taking other training, when you're looking through certifications and still studying, then you get a little bit more acquainted with other technologies or other software techniques and tricks and things that you would have never done otherwise. Uh, so I think that really keeps you with it 
and just exposes you to more and more. And that's how you get sharper because all of these things, all the facets of cybersecurity, whether you're working in strictly web application security or your malware analysis, you're deep in binaries and reverse engineering, et cetera, or maybe you like cryptography and you focus strictly on that and security, security and privacy, et cetera. All of these things still... Like they, they contact each other, they touch each other in some way in a weird Venn diagram sort of thing. So no matter what it is that you're studying, no matter what certification that you get, even at that senior level when I don't need these, quote unquote, it just makes you better. It just It's still excellent training and, and great to do to keep you growing. Absolutely. And this is the kind of thing, and Sarah, maybe you can touch on this, where we talk about that hacker mindset. And kind of like what Ted said in his uh, uh, in his keynote, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Using that hacker mentality, if we actually take it away from even technology, but being able to hack your car, hack HR, hack your career, whatever it may be. Um, but if you have that mindset of where you want to take things apart, you just have that curiosity where you want to do it. You, you may want to make it try and do something that it was never originally intended to do. But maybe even more importantly, let's fix it. If there was something wrong, let's do that. So you also have to realize that in our industry, there's a never ending escalation. And so it's a constant lifelong learning type of career. And so in order to really be that senior person, and I'll throw out some names here, I know they're competitors, but you know we, we have mad respect for everybody in the industry who's doing what we're doing. So offensive security is good. I definitely love what we're doing. I'm a little biased. You know, SANS is good. Getting some additional practice on things like Hack the Box, Try Hack Me, uh, Vuln Hub, those are all fantastic places to get that technical knowledge, that hands-on practice, and actually advance that skill to where you're getting to a more advanced level. But Sarah, again, back to you. Um, maybe you wanna share some thoughts on getting that senior level position, those little keys to the kingdom. So here's the thing. I mean, if you think at any point that you have reached the max, and you know everything there is to know in cybersecurity, you're definitely wrong. <laughs> there is always room for improvement. You should always have that mindset that you can learn more and you could do more. So at that senior level, there's still more that you can learn. And you know, if you think you're done, well, the bad guys, the, the hackers that are coming after your systems and your tools and your network, they're constantly learning. They are constantly leveling up. So if you think that you don't have to continue, yikes, they are gonna surpass you very quickly. Um, so you definitely need to continue that. The other thing I would say about um, about that is that, you know, a lot of cyber departments within companies, people are starting to realize that they need to actually have specifically, a, you know, a cyber security person, even if they're small, right? It's not, IT can't do it. IT's job is to, you know, keep the budget down as low as possible to keep things efficient. And that isn't always going to work well with cybersecurity, right? So their teams are really starting to really put this emphasis on security. And when you are a small department, even if you're senior level, if you're not learning and you're not getting these certifications, you're learning other things, doing these different types of training, you're going to be, you're going to have a really narrow view of what's possible. And if you're only thinking in the in terms of like, well, this works for us, um, it's never failed in the past, you're going to, you're going to have those blinders. So getting, a, having that diversity and having these other types of ideas um, come in from external sources are going to be really beneficial in that process. So um, yeah, you always can level up. There's always room for improvement. Never think that you're 100%. And that brings up a really good point, because sometimes you need to look at your career by standing back a little bit, because if you are honest with yourself and you know what goals you have personally, you may have to face the hard fact that the organization for which you are working right now will not give you those opportunities. Not only do those positions not exist, but they're not going to have the ability to grow. They're not going to give you the knowledge that you need. And there's only so much you can do on your own. You may have to leave and go do something else. John, anything you want to throw along those lines or maybe some pro tips for people who are looking to advance their career to a more advanced level? 
Yeah, I, I wanted to sprinkle in something, and maybe this is a, more personal to me, so I don't know how well it will work uh, for others. But so. I, I love certifications, right? I think they're fun. I think they're cool. I, I like to learn. And I like I love that training. Um, so I have overdone it. Like I, I, I probably, I think I'm in the double digits for certs, which is like cringy and embarrassing and weird. Uh, I, I am actively right now taking the offensive security exploit developer course and certification. Before we got in this panel, I was watching the videos, taking notes. I'm in Win Debugger and Ida Pro, and I don't do binary exploitation. I don't, I don't do exploit development stuff for my job. And I don't know if I, uh, if I will, uh, but to the point that Don just made, maybe someday you will, <laughs> maybe someday you might, uh, if you're interested in a different gig or if someone just kind of falls away from the spot that you call home right now. Okay. I've, I've, I've strengthened myself in that direction. And because I just want to learn and, and know more uh, to Sarah's point, no one's an expert in this. There, I don't think there are any experts in cybersecurity. But you can keep pushing yourself towards it, even if you feel like, sure, I'm, I'm senior, I'm, I'm advanced. That doesn't mean you need to stop. Don't stop. Keep learning and keep chasing the stuff that you're that you have fun with. And that's why I love doing certifications. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's also a good reason why you want to do things like go search in these other places, go do CTFs, go just play. Because yeah. you may stumble on something that you've never had to do for your job, but in order to earn the points, in order to get a little bit higher on that leaderboard, well, you had to do a little exploit dev. Well, you may find out, you know what? This is kick ass. I love this. This, yeah. this reaches me. This is something that I want to do. You would never know that unless you kind of went outside of your comfort zone. Now, that being said, lots of great stuff. Um, I at least want to get in in the last oh, eight minutes that we have at least a few questions from the audience. Um, and then again, join us in the networking lounge in Discord. So once this is done, head on over to Discord, join us in the INE career advice channel. There will be a voice channel option there as well, where we will continue this conversation and answering a whole bunch more questions that we see that are coming in from Rachel. So thanks for sending those over. But very quickly, I'm gonna throw one over to Sarah. Um, someone asks, how do we get more diversity in the field? I run programs for women and girls. Are there other ways to reach out to diverse communities? Uh, so one of my favorite things um, uh, is to 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 work with organizations that um, do this type of thing. So there's all, all sorts of um, you know women in tech and you know uh, girl coders and all those types of organizations that you know network groups and conferences, all sorts of things in in that space that you can definitely reach out to and work with. Um, so we, you know, we push some of our jobs through those types of networks on Facebook, on, on LinkedIn and, and things like that to, to really target and drive um, women to uh, apply to those different types of, of positions. Um, you know, one of the things we, we did recently to our job descriptions is literally say, you know, look, nobody checks every single box. So please apply because, you know, it's, it's I think it's pretty well known. Um, that you know, when there's a job description and there's 10, here are the 10 things that we're looking for. Um, if women uh, hit about eight out of 10, they'll be like, oh, I don't have them all. And they don't apply. Whereas men will have like three to five and still apply. So we recently changed our job description to say, look, nobody checks all the boxes, apply. Um, trying to get more women um, to, to go after those. I love that. that. That's an important point. And you've made this in so many other things. So just another quick shout out that uh, Sarah and I have been doing this for, for a long time. We do a bunch of career panels. So uh, we did it last year. We'll also do the Diana Initiative again coming up in July this year. Um, so in supporting those events, doing those subtle little changes, knowing what the mindset is of the person that is coming in to apply for that job, just making those subtle little changes can really make a difference in order to get a more diverse audience into your application pool and then eventually into your workplace. So I think that's amazing. Um, here's another one that somebody asked, um, what can colleges do to better prepare the students for the right workforce. Now, I kind of dig this question and it's something that I'm uh, kind of knee deep in at the moment at INE because we are finding that a lot of universities 
you know, the way that they create their courseware is a lot different than what we do on the training and certification side, because they have, uh, you know, they have to have textbooks involved and uh, professors, and there's a, a much larger process that they have to go through in order to create that, create that curriculum and in order to implement it. And so then what they're finding is, is that because it takes so long and it's such a massive effort, they can't necessarily keep up with the industry. And so what we're finding is that a lot of universities now are starting to include not just ours, but certifications across the board to say, look, after you reach, let's say you get done with your core curriculum and you get into more of your junior, senior years. Now, if you're really good, they're going to let you in as underclassmen, but they're going to start doing things like cybersecurity competitions. They're going to start offering their own and maybe even at a discount rate or maybe even providing it as part of their program but the ability to study for things like EJPT, Security Plus, OSCP, and all these others, they're going to supplement your university education with practical hands-on individual credentials like certifications that you can then add to your resume. So the second that you walk out of a university, not only do you have a degree, but you also have certifications. And hopefully if they're practical, you actually have some hands-on experience as well with those, as well as CTFs and cyber uh, collegiate competitions. So I think that's a fantastic thing. So if you are looking at a university program, see if they do that. So um, there's some other things. Um, there are a lot of questions about CTFs on here. So John, I'm just gonna open up the floor for you in the last couple of minutes that we have to kind of go on about what are some really cool CTFs that people can do um, at every different level and what are those that they can go check out and where, I think we both know where they can do that, <laughs> but what are some of those that are running possibly year round? So that way they don't have to wait for a specific time when an event like ours is running a CTF at a given time frame. Oh goodness, it's a, it's a laundry list. Um, for beginners and fundamentals and just kind of newcomers that want to get started, Pico CTF is phenomenal. That is typically a, a week, two-week competition, but it is open and accessible all year round. PicoCTF.com, PicoCTF.org can bring you right there. So you can totally jump in. I'm trying to release some content and videos on that. Um, intermediate, Love that one. Great suggestion. Uh, Hack the Box is currently doing their CTF cyber apocalypse thing. Uh, it's about to end today, but they are keeping the infrastructure open and available for tomorrow and maybe a little bit more of the weekend. Uh, Capture the flag, ctftime.org always has online games that are running maybe every couple of weekends. Um, Try Hack Me is always online accessible. Of course, Hack the Box, as we mentioned. Uh, it's a laundry list. <laughs> there, <laughs> might, and, and that might are. be best in Discord. <laughs> the and Exactly. And the other thing to point out is that there's a bunch of organizations out there that you know kind of fit that freemium model. Whereas, yeah, you may have to pay to get some of the more advanced stuff, but there's so much stuff you can get for free. I mean, another really good example after all the other ones that we've named, I mean, yeah, Pentester Academy is great because they have some very, you know, uh, uh, starter places to go and learn. Um, you know, Try Hack Me has the same thing where you can go in and try their rooms um, and they have the entry level ones and some that are free and then some that are not. So there's always a way for you to do that. Now, in the minute that we have left, um, Sarah, any pro tips or advice for everybody to leave them before they kick us off the stage in just a little bit? I would just say, you know, go after it. Any of the things that you that you can do and you have access to in your free time, it really just shows, you know, to to, to hiring managers and, and to recruiters that you're really passionate about what you're doing. And I would just say, don't forget to put those things on your resume. Um, There's so many times I talk to a candidate um, and I ask them if they do a CTF, if, if they do any of these bug bounties, and they don't put it on their resume. Um, they think that it has to be an official job in order to put it on there. So don't don't waste that that experience that you have. Make sure you get it on your resume. Excellent. John, any last second pro tips? I will echo Sarah because that's perfect. Uh, look, don't be afraid to go be a rock star and then don't hesitate to tell people about it, like sell yourself. I don't care if you're throwing applications to a dozen companies. I, I don't know. I Some people have different opinions on that, but I think it's great to just see what you can be a part of and know your own worth, be able to be a part of that and uh, be a rock star. <laughs> There's nothing holding you back. Don't let yourself be the thing that's holding you back. 
I, I love that. And using right. you as the perfect example. I mean, if you look at where John was two years ago and where he is now, um, it really doesn't take that long in order to build up a following if you really love what you're doing and you're great at it, which he is. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. A quick reminder that go join us right now, immediately after uh, this live stream. Go join us in Discord in the networking lounges. So if you go look on Discord, you'll have the networking lounges, and one of them will be the INE Career Advice Channel. We will have a voice channel open so you can communicate with us. We can even unmute you so you can talk with us directly if you'd like. So that's going to be really cool. And I'll just just leave it with that final marketing piece because even though we want you know 99% of the content to be educational, marketing makes the world go round. So without a doubt, go into Discord, go check out the uh, basic information that we have on our INE Starter Pass, which is 100% free for everybody all the time. Comes with a totally free pen testing student course, which is practical, hands on. It's exactly what John had recommended earlier, and you can try it absolutely free. With that, thank you for your time. Thank you to the IoT Village, and we will see you in Discord. Happy hacking. Thanks,